טוב, חבר'ה, אז ברוכים הבאים, ברוכים הבאים ללול. מחכה לנו סשן שנראה מאוד מעניין היום. No your audience, זה נושא שתמיד מטריד את כולנו פחות או יותר כל הזמן. עכשיו יותר טוב? מעולה. אז uh, היום נדבר על uh, No You Audience, שזה נושא שמטריד את רובנו uh, רוב הזמן. Uh, יש לנו שלושה דוברים uh, מרתקים, והאמת שיש המון תוכן ויש מצב שגם נגלוש בזמנים. אז אם למישהו שממש קשה עם זה שיגיד, אם לא אז פשוט uh, נמשיך עד כמה שיהיה אפשר uh, מצד כולם. יש לנו את uh, uh, נמרוד הלוי, מפייסבוק. Client Solutions Manager, שידבר על הכלים של פייסבוק לפאנל וסגמנטיישן, ואחרי זה תבוא דניה מ-Everything.me, שתגיד בדיוק ההפך, תגיד שזה בכלל לא חשוב, ובעצם תדבר רק על KTIים, ובכלל לא צריך להכיר את ה-user ואת הפאנל ואת הסגמנטיישן, אני מניח, ומסימל הווייב יש לנו את ניצן, Head of Product Marketing, שידבר על איך הם מצליחים להפוך את ה... Voice of the customer ל-actionable insights ובסוף, אני מקווה שיהיה לנו זמן, נעשה גם קצת שאלות ותשובות ונעשה קצת כל זה בזמן הרבה שיש לנו תהנו, יהיה מעניין שלום לכולם, שומעים אותי? שומע את עצמי מעולה תמיד שיש לי מיקרופון, אני כזה רוצה להתחיל לעשות את זה כאלה אני אשתדל לשלוט בעצמי בכל אופן, שלום ונעים מאוד אחר צהריים טובים שמי נמרוד הלוי, אני Client Solution Managers בפייסבוק. Client Solution Managers בפייסבוק עובדים עם הלקוחות על המדיה שלהם. עוזרים ללקוחות לטייב את ההשקעה שלהם בפייסבוק ובאמת להשיג תוצאות יותר טובות תמורת הפרסום. אני בפייסבוק כבר ארבע וחצי שנים. הייתי שלוש שנים בדבלין, עברנו למשרד בתל אביב לפני כשנה עם כל הצוות. ואני באמת אדבר איתכם על uh, Know Your Audience בקצב של מהירות האור, מכיוון שחשבנו שיש 45 דקות, ואז הסתבר שיש 35 דקות, ואז הסתבר שיש 25 דקות, אז אני לא יודע כמה זמן זה ייקח, אבל הרן רייט שלנו הוא לפחות משקף לדקה, אז תנסו לעקוב, ואם לא, אז גם לא נורא. Um, אנחנו הולכים לדבר... רגע, excuse me, I started in Hebrew. Are there any, like, non-Hebrew speakers in the audience? So you guys don't understand the word of, of what I say. סבבה. Let's move to English. So I'm Nimrod from um, Facebook and I'm a Client Solutions Manager. We're going to start by flipping the question and not ask whether you know your audience, rather ask whether your audience knows you because this is really, really important and we're going to hopefully come to the conclusion that it's the two sides of the same coin. Then we're going to talk a little bit about real people on Facebook. We're going to talk about targeting and, and tailored messaging because tar targeting without tailored messaging is somewhat of completely useless. And then we're going to wrap up with some insights. Um, some of the insights that Facebook provides, some of the insight tools that Facebook provides for the community and developers and advertisers in order to identify and analyze um, actionable business objective tuned objective. All right. So, let's start with the common mistake. The common mistake is, for those who don't read Hebrew, this sign says, everything to the house, um, household, present, electrical product, bar, uh, accessories, electrical material, um, garden furniture, um, and some doors and locks. So if we ask the owner of this shop, Mr. Achim Yakubian, who is his client, he's probably going to tell us everyone. And it's true, because if we look at the population and look at the huge menu of product that Achim Yakubian sells, probably every person in the population will need something from this shop in the next, say, three months. A lamp, or a pot, or a new matate room. But the thing is that no one, the clients don't really know and realize this. So it is very, very hard to convince Mr. Achim Yalkobian that by trying to aim to everyone and be so wide, 
with the definition of his product, he's basically targeting no one. So everything in this regard, everyone is no one. And the contrary is this marketing genius in action that if we ask him if he knows to draw and describe his clients, he's going to do it very easily and with amazing precision. So for those who don't read Hebrew, this means the National Center for Mattresses and Sofas for Youth. Not just mattresses, not just beds. Those who are for youth, for teenagers only. And this is very, very, like this is fundamental and intentionally I brought an example from the offline world because this doesn't really relate to online, rather to basic marketing. In order to make ourselves accessible to clients, we need to be very clear about who we are. So the practice would be to start by defining ourselves, who we are and who is our client, and then calibrate this against our marketing efforts. So you know the, the joke about um, that big data is like teenage sex. Because everybody are talking about this and everybody thinks that everybody does it and everybody wants to do it, so everybody say that they do it, but no one does it. And I kind of tend to agree. Big data is a word like potential or love. It lack context completely. And I don't think that for most of us or most businesses in the world, big data is even relevant. Because again, we're not aiming for everyone and no one cares about how many people cross the road today between 5th and 77 in New York or how many buttons of the second floor of the elevator were pushed more than twice today. No one cares. This is just an ocean of irrelevant noise that there is out there and we need to make sense and pull only those signals that we care about for our business. <coughs> so having said that, with that reservation, definitely there are signals and there is information in this huge ocean of senseless, directionless noise that we as, as, as advertisers can really um, leverage and utilize. And this is an example, this is me. And this is just a very tiny list of signals and indicators that I'm leaving after me as I go online. And for advertisers, all they need to do is basically set the right net of information collection or gathering in order to identify any of these signals. And I promise to you that if an advertiser finds that one of the, these signals makes me a potential client for his product, I will love to see their ad on my newsfeed. And this is essentially the order that we are trying to make in this mountains of irrelevant information. And basically, if I'm taking an example from the neurophysiological world, we have what we call receptors in our brain and in our body, with which we feel and sense. We have pain and joy, and we hear things, and we see colors. And we have special designated receptors to each one of these signals, otherwise, we will simply be blind and deaf, right? We won't be seeing anything and we won't be able to notice nothing. So also as advertisers, back to online and to business and to monetization and growth and acquisition, we as advertisers need to create a set of receptors that will collect the right signals for us to be able to know better our audience. So if we take it back from biology to internet and computers, these receptors are actually pixels, many, many, many pixels. And just like in the matrix, so actually the matrix is a great story that really expresses this idea because this is in fact what we're doing. We're pixeling, we're setting these little antennas that indicate user behavior and user preferences and with them we draw a very accurate picture of our client. What they do, how they behave, what they prefer, and this 
Image is actually not static. It's dynamic and it's moving with time. And this is, this is what advertisers are actually looking at. So this is no secret and advertisers are digging deep into the signals and the behaviors that they would like to make sense of in order to understand their customer behavior. And with 71% leading is customer service history. So it's a very common practice within marketers to look at their current client and conclude based on that what is the kind of client that they are looking forward. And this is customer service history and obviously demographics. So let's talk a little bit about real people on Facebook. We have 936 million of them visiting the site every day of which almost 800 million do it on their mobile devices. So first of all, unprecedented reach. We can reach most of the people out there, almost on a daily basis. And we can do it with huge accuracy. Now, let's just pause for a second. How many people in the room saw this slide before? Please raise your hand. Oh, okay, so we still have a lot of work to do. I thought that everybody saw this slide. This is like one of the most used slides, but we just can't go without it. Um, Facebook is very accurate because people are willingly feeding the information about themselves when they log into the service. Also, as they go and serve and connect and communicate and interact with various objects that we can interpret later to signals. And verse, when we compare compare Facebook accuracy with the average online uh, industry, we see that the narrower we get, the more the advantage that Facebook has over other publishers. And it makes sense, because if you want to target women 25 to 45, anywhere in the net, you can probably reach 65, 70% accuracy. But if you want to add to that, that these are moms that like fashion, that drive, that lives in a perimeter of 25 miles around London, and that they use iPhone, you're pretty much left with only Facebook that can provide you with these insights. And we are also monitoring and tracking people across device. And this is also something that is very, very unique to Facebook. We measure real people because we don't look at screens or cookies or devices or proxies. We look at a Facebook ID, regardless of the user journey that they do, and we're going to um, look about uh, on, on this a little bit later. But the thing is that we're following around people wherever they go and with which device that they are using. And this is the user journey. Now, this is a slide that is composed of three different sources, three different studies, Comscore, Facebook Internal, um, Delivery Science, and I think Mil Milward Brown. And it creates a very, very complex picture of what's going on in this space of multi-device. And as you can see, 65% of the people, they access their mobile while they are in the store. 40% actually compare prices and or purchase online. 41% switch devices to continue a task. So 41% of the people complete a conversion or a task with more than one device. And then the bottom line of it is that 32% of overall desktop conversions on Facebook start with a touch on mobile. So first of all, let's just agree, if we, are, if we are missing mobile and tablets, we are literally overstating reach by much and understating frequency by much. Because we think that we reach many, many people. In fact, it's this little baby that sits there and click by now on his dad laptop, and we are not aware of that. There's a funny video about this. Um, and this is something that we see about the trend and the shift between devices. This is what we call user journey. Again, because Facebook has such a comprehensive solution of tracking on mobile with our SDK and conversion tracking pixel for our desktop, we can basically draw the entire journey and also measure the, the, the shift 
from currently from only from mobile sorry from yeah from mobile to desktop so people still tend to prefer to convert on desktop even if they are being exposed to mobile but it's not rare and it's not a one off it's an actual massive trend that people see the first impression on mobile but then later on convert on desktop and as you can see between the three vertical there are there are differences there is like a, a, a very wide range of behaviors and we could think of reasonable reasons for why would that be and why would that vary between vertical to vertical all i can say is that for instance with e-commerce where 40 percent of people convert on desktop it makes sense because e-commerce is a very developed vertical when it comes to native apps so amazon and asus and big e-commerce sites they have native apps which makes it really easy to convert on the other hand um, in travel, for instance, we see that even though many travel companies have native apps, still most of the conversions occur on desktop, and we might just simply relate that to the fact that people take time to plan their travels and journeys, and they meet. The, they meet basically the service in many points over time, and then in many times they simply convert, convert to desktop because it makes sense, because you can see the little letters and it's essential to see the little letters when you're paying two thousand dollars for a flight ticket um, but there might be other reasons and the only thing that is important to, to to be aware of is that this journey is is a a massive part of the traffic and the behavior and we must think about it and and calculate this when we are setting up our marketing efforts so people this is insane. This is an um, uh, IDC always connected report from March 2013. 79% of US smartphone holders keep the device with them for all but two hours of their waking hours. Basically, you don't take the mobile with you only when you are taking a shower. And, well, we can basically stop here and say, well, if you want to know your audience, all you have to do is become a mobile device. And then you know your audience, because you're always with your audience, you're always with your client, wherever he is. Indoor, outdoor, night, morning, etc., etc. And this slide is not as exciting as the story that it entails. This is the story of a media revolution. This is the first time in 2013 in 70 years, I think, that a media channel won, took over the dominant media. The last time such a thing happened was 70, in the 50s of the last century, where TV took over radio, and since, TV, TV dominated. And in 2013, the time spent on digital, both mobile and desktop, surpassed TV for the first time. And as you can see in 2013, this trend continues and not because people stop watching TV people still watch a lot of TV but people started to consume digital media in addition to their time spent on TV 267 percent in the last three years so infrastructures good devices free data packages more more video more formats are basically paving the way to this trend where since we have more devices and more technologies, we simply consume more media. And one of the reasons why time spent on digital went so big so rapidly is because of video consumption. And we see it very well on Facebook, where last year in two months, the time spent viewing video on Facebook um, rose by 50% in two months, soon after we launched Autoplay. And this is like ever since it's been growing. But also notice that 65% of this time is on mobile and it completely makes sense. If each one of you will think for himself, you watch most of the mobile, much of, most of the videos you watch on, on, on Facebook, YouTube, you, you hover them with your um, finger on your mobile device. And it's not only in mobile. So overall we see that video consumption is growing 
at a crazy rate of 400% in three years. Since Q12 to 2014, 400% growth in, in, in mobile media consumption. Which brings us to a situation where people consume seven hours of content in five hours. So, this is interesting, and the interesting thing to say in regard to that is that people don't react in the same way to the, to the content that they see in different devices, even when the content is identical. So Facebook commissioned a study with this company that I don't remember its name, but it was in the center of neuroeconomic studies. And they wanted to check how people respond to the same content when viewed on mobile versus viewed on TV. And the findings were quite amazing, and we don't have time to, to go through the entire study, but the bottom line is that even though the, the, the level of emotional engagement between TV and mobile is on par, relatively on par, on, on, we, we discovered that on mo when people are seeing video on mobile, they are more motivated and they are more, more in an approach mode. Basically, they are more receptive and open and, and, and also, say, focused on the content that they consume. When they watch the same content on TV, they are distracted and they are cognitively loaded. Their brains work harder and they are more distracted when they watch a TV ad. And it's interesting because one of the, one of the possible explanations is simply that when you look at your mobile screen, it kind of closes your periphery. So you are more concentrated in the screen. The screen is small, but it's, smaller, it's closer to you. And when you watch TV from four or five meters away, you kind of see a lot of things that are happening on, on that space. So what I just want to say in regard to that is that we need to remember that the reaction for the content that we're showing is going to be different between devices, even if it is the same content. So we need to think where we show the relevant content to actually achieve the best result. And this is another study that we did with Nielsen. We were trying to measure lift in, ad, in, a, in brand metrics, such as ad recall, brand awareness, and purchase intent, <coughs> over time while watching video. And we discovered something really, really, really staggering. Most of the set, most of the impact, most of the shift in perception or learning that we get from looking at the video ad is achieved within the first three seconds. Correct. And most of it is actually up to 10 seconds, but even but half of it is within the first three seconds. So what am I saying? What's the recommendation that follows this? You don't need more than a 15 video, 15 seconds video, and please make sure to pass the message in the first five seconds, and you're sorted. And the last thing is that if we're going back to that slide and talking about the differences in perception and cognitive processing between TV and, and, and mobile, then remember that this, is, this applies for mobile, not for TV. Basically what I'm saying is that you might need five to 15 seconds on TV to achieve the same shift and resonance and impact that you achieve on mobile video for three, between three and 10 seconds. Good, another just one word on video. We are constantly improving and revamping the insights that we share on video in order to enable as much insights and understanding to our community of developers and advertisers. So video views, how we uh, views to 25%, 50%, 75%, 95%, a break of click to play versus auto play is coming soon, a break of sound on off is coming on, so we're constantly revamping and 
adding more and more features into the insights of video because we understand that this format is definitely the key. And personally, I believe that in four or five years, we're going to see that most creatives are video, just because they can. Sound and motion works better than image, but works better than text. And since we have the technologies and the infrastructures to show video for very cheap, then it's all moving to video. Good. Last part is targeting and tailored messaging. As I said, targeting without tailored messaging is leaving money on the table. This is where we were a few years ago. This is where we are now. We can really, really very granularly see who are we targeting and target, target them based on many, many um, parameters of what they do, their behavior, their purchase intent, um, their demographics, their likes and interests, things that they care about. And so, so how do we do this? This is really hard. Facebook needs, well, how to say, it's really hard to beat the news feed algorithm because you need to be ruthless and you need to basically overrule 1,500 stories out of 1,600 possible stories for every session. So we need to look at every one of these 1.4 billion people that use Facebook and think for each one of them and calculate separately for each one of them which 100 stories are going to be the stories that are most interesting for them. And we are doing it based on hundreds and hundreds of factors that we gather, including third-party data, including online and offline data. And we are also allowing our advertisers to use some of these factors, we call them targeting options, to, to our advertisers to, to be able to also reach the people with content that they care about. So first, what we call core audiences, these are targeting options that are native to Facebook. Um, interest, location, demographics. Um, we also are working with third part data providers such as Axiom and Data Logics and Epsilon to provide behavioral information that is basically a part of our native targeting options. However, I must just state that partner categories is available only for US, UK, Germany, and France. Secondly, we came up with what we call audiences. These are the people that you know. This is your data. This is your emails, your phone numbers, your Facebook user ID or app user ID, or also people that are visiting in your online assets, your native app or your website. When we look at what kind of use cases there are to actually leveraging your own data to create interaction and market further to your clients, businesses are looking at all kinds of segments to actually um, come up with, with relevant promotions or offers. When it comes to online, obviously also within your um, native app, whether you are a mobile developer or only website, if you're only a website, you could color with the Facebook pixel these audiences and you can create great combinations or cuts or verticals. For instance, you could cut only those people who saw your ad more than 14 days ago added something to their cart but didn't convert. But only those who didn't convert for, for more than two weeks because you know that for your business, people take two weeks to convert. For example, so you could basically color any audience based on app events within native or based on URL or event on web to create audiences that are, how to, how to translate that ad is the bunch of accepted. The creme de la creme of your, of your high value users. And there's the lookalike audiences, which is the next best thing because talking, communicating, interacting, broadcasting to your current client is one and it's good and it's important but you need to grow your business.
Basically, you need a tool that will enable you to use the seed of your audience and give you many, many more like that. So, even though the algorithm is a complete mystery, like the Coca-Cola recipe or something, and it's, it's an entirely black box, definitely we're seeing all across verticals that once you go look alike, you don't look back. Because it is by far the most effective way of targeting for acquisition and growth. In one word, how this works, we take your seed audience, it can be a thousand people, it can be 10,000 people, we kind of index them by 10,000 different categories. And we get a number, 1.37. And then we run this number against the entire population and we collect those who are closer to this number from below and from above. And this actually creates an audience that even though we sometimes don't know in what exactly is it so similar to our audience, it is. And so, so we got to the point where, wow, we can reach people and like literally personally and really know who they are, what they care about, what is relevant to them, where are they physically, what time of the day is it, what kind of usage patterns they have over devices or formats, etc., etc. And then we just want to tell them, hey, you, you're my client, right? But basically, if we don't come with the right message, we, we, we miss the whole opportunity and we're leaving all the money on the table. Because these two ladies might look like sisters. They're actually both in the luxury beauty segment, but they will not respond to the same message. Because one is a brand heavy and one is a deal seeker. One cares about the new collection and one cares about free shipping and, 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 and discounts. The psychology, of consumers and their behaviors and their tendencies and what makes it work for them is different. And the better we get at realizing that, the more we can basically yield from our marketing efforts. This is just another example of sedan, sedan, Renault sedan, anyone knows the car? It's a car that is basically intended for women, 18 to 45. So then when the, the next step and segmented the message to outdoor fitness, moms, and eco-environmentalist awareness. They, just, they didn't even change the video, they just changed the message and the copy and spoke to these different audiences in a way that is relevant to them. Last example is Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola did the campaign last year, um, America is Beautiful, very, very American song about how beautiful is America, if you would imagine. And the thing is that they created such clever segments in their population and they managed to reach immense volumes and sizes of audience. So you should do too. This is your sweet spot. This is where, this is the holy grail of, of, of everything I spoke about. Because this is the point where your audiences are segmented so well you don't need to brainstorm about the creative. Your message is, is landing. Soon as you can segment in your photo taking app only the people who take one photo a day, what are you going to tell them? You want to try? To post more photos, right? Highlight filters customers are not purchasing or whatever. So as soon as we are talking to a very granular intended segment, we know what to tell them. And this works. This is the holy grail. And this can also be automized. Now, we're out of time. One and a half minutes. Just one word on insights. We have page insights. Free. We have ads insights. Free. We have audience insights. Free. We have Facebook analytics for developers. And Facebook IQ for the vast majority of population. Also free. And just one word about audience. I wanna, I wanna highlight the audience, uh, the, the audience insights. Audience insights is a system that shows me how my audience, my page audience, my website audience, my custom website audience, is relatively to the benchmark of the entire population of Facebook. 
So here, for instance, I can see that my audience is over-indexing on the women 35 to 44, over-indexing on jobs as education and healthcare, over-indexing on the low online purchase, primarily buying with their credit card and our iPhone users. Now, you tell me, is this helpful that you now know that your client is woman 35 to 44 who works in education and healthcare buying cheap stuff online with her credit card on her iPhone? This is tremendously helpful. This saves a lot of money to you. And obviously, people inside go to insights at fb.com. There's a new study published every week on people, on industry research, on holiday and event, things like a new study about newlyweds in the US or a chatter that can show you what are the subjects that are being discussed by age, gender, and subject. So this is gold for you guys. And I think that the problem is that it's free. This is why you're not using it. If you would pay $1,500 a month to Facebook to get access for the Facebook insights, you would have an analyst sitting there, then I dig in data. So I just want to leave you with that. Please, go home and use these free services because there is nothing else like that that can teach you so much about your audiences and your client as the Facebook ecosystem, platform, and insights. Thank you very much. So I'm, uh, you have to excuse me because I'm recovering from a, a malicious cold. I might have to stop to breathe, come up to breathe about after two words or something. Um, but it's your lucky day because since I can't speak so much, I will, I think I will do it in 15 minutes or something. So yeah, good day for everybody. But lots of insights. I will start with a short game. Um, can you play with me? That's good, because you'll do the stuff you should do. So first of all, anyone here prefers Monica over Rachel in France? Anyone? Raise your hand. Monica over Rachel, OK. Uh, how many of you were born in the 70s? Oh, cool. We're the dinosaurs. Um, OK. How many of you identify as a female today and as they woke up? How many of you are identified as Very good. Um, how many of you are doing, oh, has the title, the word marketing in their title? Cool. How many of you did acquisition in their past? How many did acquisition with their own hands? Okay, cool. Um, how many did A-B testing in their lifetime? Groovy. Now I know you, right? I know every one of you, and I can sell you just about anything. Anyone want some ice? or diapers, or because now I know you, right? I know you have about 50% female, by the way, amazing uh, female rate for a, a conference like this. Um, and I know that some of you were born in the, in the 70s, so I know you, I can now market you whatever I want, right? Well, no, because it doesn't work like that. I mean, not as far as I'm concerned. Um, I need to hit something so that the computer will do what Ah, okay. This is Shiri from Similar Web. She used to work with me in everything me, so now she's a... Uh... Oh, no. So, you're going to pretend that you can read the whole sentence, then I will... So hello again, I'm Dania, I'm from Everything Me, and I'm here to talk about, well, it's funny because I'm going to say exactly the same things that Nimrod just said, but I think that the order of the words would be uh, in the other direction. So first of all, um, I wrote this title for this uh, little presentation, and the title was uh, How to Ignore Profiling on Your Way to Effective KPI-Based Marketing. Now, there's a lot of buzzwords there, right? I kind of used them all up. So I want to tell you why did I pick these words and I'm going to deconstruct the sentence and see what it actually means. Um, well, Everything Me is a company that does a launcher. Anyone here has an Android device? Not enough. 
Okay, so I will explain just what a launcher is because I will use it later on. Everything me. Uh, a launcher, generally speaking, is something between an app and an OS. It gives you the ability, if you're not tied in the golden cuffs of an iPhone, of changing the way your phone behaves. So what everything me does is the best we can do, which is kind of amazing, of making the most out of your phone just for you. So, as Imran said, and I'm quoting, to know your users, you have to know them on their mobile. Well, we are their mobile. At everything me, we are their mobile. So I know my users. I mean, I don't really want to know them, but I know them pretty well. So let's start with that, what I always tell my kids. That's the click. When you hear someone say something, you need to know the setting or the framework in which he said that. So everything I will say uh, about this sentence has to do with the fact that I am mobile and I am B2C. Okay, you have to remember that because I want you to have critical thoughts like my kids. <laughs> so it's B2C, it apps, and specifically on Android, but I'm going to tell you about Android. I think most of it, if not some of it, would be good for you on your line of work. So let's break it down. What is marketing? Well, you can't see, but after the slide, there's, there are words there. Marketing has changed a lot in the past few years. Um, I think we all use the term performance-based marketing now. Uh, I personally never did any traditional marketing. I'm not a PR person. I didn't do outreaches or conventions. I don't do those kind of things. What I mostly do is talk to people. And the uh, equivalence of today's talking is one-on-one -on -one marketing. Now, funny story, one-on-one -on -one marketing is something that is done for ages. It's actually the oldest kind of marketing. Um, but more recently, when I worked in Logia, I think it was the Logia Mobile that was around 2007 or six or whatever, we had a person whose title was uh, uh, in charge of one-on-one -on -one marketing. What this person did is sent SMS campaigns to people to download the new Royal Golan song or whatever. Now, it didn't target everybody, it just targeted the people who are more inclined to download the Eyal Golan new song or the new, we're talking about J2 and me, not iPhones, okay? It's like uh, 16 poly ringtones. Um, so one-on-one exists for a very long time and I think the performance-based marketing is the one-on-one -on -one marketing. Now, when I want to talk to users, much like Nimrod said, I can actually talk to specific people. I can approach um, Sagi and talk to him about music, and I approach, can approach everybody and target my message around it. Now, I'm repeating what Nimrod said, Khon. It's basically the same thing, but I said that I don't need profiling. So, next. Performance-based, one-on-one message to person. Click. Let's talk about KPIs, because to have an effective or a good marketing campaign, you should know what your targets are. I can talk on and on about KPIs, but I won't because I don't have enough air right now. But I believe you all have KPIs. Anyone here doesn't have a KPI, they wake up in the morning and they wonder what they need to do with their lives because I have a great shrink. No, seriously, anyone here doesn't have a KPI? No one? Cool. Because there used to be many Israeli startups used to get up in the morning and say, we want users. How many? Lots of them. Okay, what are you going to do with them? M monetize through ads, uh, something. So having a KPI is a very important thing. I lead my life and lead my, um, lead my marketing department by KPIs. But you have to be very precise when you choose your KPI. For example, everything needs a launcher, as I told you, it's an amazing launcher, it's the best launcher in the market. But any launcher has a big problem. We, if I would uh, phrase it in a simple language, we go on a first date with someone, and at the end of the date, we ask them to marry us. It, it's a crazy thing. I mean, you install the launcher, and after five minutes, we, we tell the user, okay, now you want to stay with me forever and ever and ever and ever. And this is a very hard thing to ask from a user. So what I need to do as marketing is to approach the right people who would be, who would want to have this kind of relationship with me as a launcher. So I will actually tell you what my KPIs are. It, it changes from the uh, paid acquisition part to the organic part, but generally speaking, um, as you can probably guess,
KPIs for launchers are mainly on loyalty and uh, lifetime value. So loyalty is mostly measured uh, where I stand with the retention. So my basic KPI for my department is a five-letter KPI. It's called ECPD7. That's, that's effective cost per day seven. Okay, so I take all the efforts that I do, the organic efforts and the paid efforts, and eventually I get a number per segment. I get an ECPD7 for users from Mexico, and I get an ECPD7 for tablets. Okay, it, it changes. It's, it, those are segments. This is how we roll. So, um, I think a company should have a KPI, lifetime value or something big, but each department should, has its own KPIs. Next. Click, click, click. This is a, a new thing I invented today. CP, cost per KPI. I don't know, take the, take the salary of your engineers and see how much did it cost you to get in a specific KPI. Okay, so now we talk about effectiveness. I feel like I'm doing a, uh, okay. So, we're gonna talk about effectiveness and I wanna focus on one specific thing and then I'm gonna get to the profiling stuff. So, effectiveness, when I talk about effectiveness, I mean effectiveness through the whole funnel. If we said KPI, KPIs can be um, chosen to the funnel. For example, Shai, the guy who does the acquisition, he has a different KPI for banners and a different KPI for um, conversion in the store. Now I'm gonna walk you through, anyone here has an app? Anyone promotes an app? So for those of you who don't know, we have one landing page. Apps have one landing page. It's the Play Store or the App Store. And just this is a side note that should be on a totally different uh, session, but recently we have been using the A-B testing of Google. It was recently released. Uh, we were A-B, we were beta testers of that, and our uh, organic traffic increased in 3.5 times. I will say the numbers. We used to have around 8K users per day, organic, and now we have 25K consistently every month, every day, okay? So if you have an app and you're not using the Ava tool testing to optimize, do it now, talk to me later, I'll show you how because it's we have one billion users per month, new, just, to, just they just come. <laughs> so, effectiveness for me is the whole funnel. I want to have, um, I want to see if effectiveness throughout the funnel, and in apps that means that I want to have an effective first impression with the user, and an effective first brand awareness with user. And with apps, there is something very different from other things because the consideration part, you know the user cycle of uh, brand awareness and consideration and that and that, that. The consideration part is has moved. It used to be something that you do before you install and then uh, you make the decision and you install an app and now consideration is done on Play Store and then it's done in the first few minutes and even a few days after. So consideration is a very, very long stage and you can imprint the user. You can Make him make the right decision at the right time if you know how to do it. So if, when I say effectiveness, I mainly mean choose where you want to be more effective. Um, funnel is best described, I think, as just buckets of water. Think about buckets of water that's being poured on your Play Store page and the other bucket starts losing some water and you want to get enough users to ECPD7, so you have to do a very good job by finding the right users and targeting them, etc. Next. Now we're getting to the real stuff. So I said ignore, but basically that's just a clickbait, okay? I don't really mean ignore. What I mean is to change the order of things. I think this is, I think the only thing that you should think about is how to not profile your users. Um, we have um, a very cool algorithmic guy who used to work for Upbrain, uh, uh, Upbrain, no? Brain, but uh, oh, wait, thank you. I'm sick. It's okay. So um, he told me something. He looked at our marketing uh, uh, strategies and he said, "Well, you're basically doing machine learning, but you're doing it in a manual way. So how do you do machine learning in a manual way? You can use a lot of Facebook tools. Just I, I don't know if you know, but some of the tools we all spoke about at the end are very uh, suitable for." Uh, manual machine learning, but let's talk about how we do it. I don't care 
who you are. I don't care if you're a boy, a girl, if you're 18, or if you're 75. I don't care. All I care about is that you would enjoy the product. So I put a little flags, which are events, inside my, um, my app, and I can select and I can track those, and I can use them to get more users like you. And then I don't need to profile in advance. I can profile based on the user's behavior. So it's behavioral uh, marketing that you don't need the real person to, you don't, you don't need to get to the real person at the end. The only thing I can tell you that is for sure is language. I mean, there's one thing I know for sure that if you target a person in his language, it raises uh, what I told you about the Play Store page. It can raise, uh, in, in average, 7% in conversion. Uh, on the Play Store page, if you target the person in his language, but other than being, other than using the right language, I don't care if you're a boy or a girl. If you have, if you think that the message of organizing your phone suits you, just go ahead and do it. I will give some examples of that. For example, I never tried targeting people in Mexico, and then I started targeting people in Mexico speaking Spanish, and I found out that. People who has S3 devices in Mexico are the most loyal users I've ever had. Now, initially I thought it was a bug. I said, what, something is wrong. And so we always say, when something is so good with data, you always say, oh my god, it's a bug. Something is significantly fucked. So I took those users and analyzed them even more. I found out that all of them had uh, TouchWiz as their initial launcher, which is what comes with the S3. And well, basically, that experience sucks. So everything you get that will kick out um, the TouchWiz works amazingly. Indians, people who have Note 2, are inclined to stay with us forever and ever. I don't know why they don't quit, but this is what I mean. You don't need to know in advance who to target. You need to see who responds well to your messaging. And this is why you can weave a line, a thread, from the first impression, from the first two seconds of the user, till the end of his or hers, it's life. Um, another notion about it is that we did testing around, I told you that the funnel is kind of complicated because you get you talk to the users and then they get to the Play Store and then they download and they have the onboarding. And this all lasts a long time. And you have to make sure that your experiments don't get contaminated by other experiments, okay? So what we did with the uh, Play Store before we had the A-B testing tool, that we used to change uh, the messaging week by week. And then we kind of understood which messaging works with which original messaging priming in the store, and we kept it. Okay, so what if, I don't know if it's, if it's coming clear or not. I need your head to nod if it's not clear. Do know if it's not clear. Okay, good. So, ha, huh, no air. Um, so basically what I'm trying to say is that you don't need to profile your users. You just need to learn how they behave. I think I can only say that because I am mobile. And since I'm mobile, I know you. I mean, I don't want to know you. I don't know who you are. And this is something we're very strict about. But I know ex exactly what you will do while you are in our product. So, next. So what I'm talking about, so what I'm talking about is doing, moving the profiling to the post action part. By the way, I did some profiling and it was super fun. I found out that many of our American users are big fans of Kevin Smith. I used uh, Google Analytics Insight Thinking. It helped me a lot, a lot. Changed my work. No, it didn't. It, I, it didn't change anything with what I do. But when I found out that um, Russians, for example, are not coming from Facebook, this helped me a lot. I mean, when I traced where they come from, and I continued getting more traffic from there. So the funny thing about what Nimrod said is that uh, one of the main tools I use in KPI-based marketing is the lookalikes of Facebook. I mean, I can use Facebook lookalikes to target specific events within my app for acquisition, but this is only for the paid part. The organic part, no one can do the job for you. You will have to sit down with your database bases and write the right queries to find out what is the post-action profile of the users. And we didn't even talk about engagement, which is a whole different story. Um, I think this is it. Click, yeah, questions? Anyone? No? Well, I'm reachable in 
those email addresses that are not written on the screen. <laughs> today's talk is actually that the, the building a fact base about your customer is really about listening to your customer. It doesn't sound shocking, um, uh, but it can be. Um, so it's really about, you know, you can listen in a lot of different ways. You can interview, you can do survey, you can watch the behavior of your customer, as we've kind of heard, um, but it is about listening, uh, which sounds fine. Except for, Jerry, how good are Israelis really at listening? So I'm going to just go down and um, share four different quotes with you. These are not things I made up. These are things that I've heard multiple times in my past couple years here. First, one, I've been a product manager for two years, but I've never spoken to a customer. I wish I had, but I'm not sure it's that relevant. Two. I know this is a feedback session about your trial period with us, but I just want to interrupt you to show you why our product is better than the one you are currently using. Three, yes, I talked to some customers. I walked down Rochia's and I had lunch with my friend who uses my service. I give him a discount. Four, I know what the customers want better than they do themselves, so I don't need to talk to that many. It's a little funny. But I've heard every single one of these things many times since I've come to Israel. I didn't hear them that much when I was in the Silicon Valley and when I was working locally. Why is that? I think one, we have a lot of businesses uh, where we have user acquisition, performance marketing. You can actually be a product manager um, you know, who's, who doesn't talk to the customers and make a big difference in your ROI through A-B testing. Uh, you can also, because of our amazing startup ecosystem, just walk down the street, have lunch with a friend, and actually get some very real, interesting feedback um, that's going to help you. So it's not all bad. But when you do listening in this way, you actually miss very significant sectors of your customer base, and you can misunderstand what people are telling you. 
And on this last point, I know what customers want better than they do themselves. Uh, sometimes it is true. Sometimes when you're the founder or CEO of a startup and you're building for a pain point that you're intimately familiar with from your former life, you may know what you need. But when you're at the point that similar web is, thousands of customers, you don't even know who they are. So how do you know what they need better than they know themselves? Um, so just, uh, I'm gonna tell you a bit of a story about my time at SimilarWeb. Like I said, I joined four months ago, so this is really about um, a, a very short story about what we've done since, since I joined. For those of you who aren't aware, SimilarWeb is actually in a very um, amazing place right now. We've got an amazing growth in number of customers and in our revenue, and we're hiring to support that growth um, quite a bit this year. So 100 people kind of coming in this year. Um, the situation when I arrived was that we had many customers who were just signing up online, buying without ever talking to a sales person at our company. We also had customers who were coming, talking to a sales person, but the conversations were about sales. Um, so we didn't have a great sense of who these thousands of customers were. Um, I could segment them by their plan type, I could segment them by a lot of things, but I didn't know what are their real needs, what are they actually kind of doing? Um, what do they want from us? And so um, my focus, in addition to the basic data analysis kind of segmentation that I could do from the, the minimal data that I had, was actually interviewing. In the first uh, three months, I probably I interviewed 50 or 70 different customers. Um, I guess the second point that I want to make very clear from this conversation is interviewing is not just about, you know, walk down the street, have lunch with your friend. Interviewing actually has a very clear methodology behind it, and it can be a science in the way that these other kind of talks have been about science. So um, if you do these things, and many others, you can actually create a very uh, data-driven interview process. So one, choose the right sample, critical. Write an interview guide, actually have a very specific set of questions, which are hypothesis-driven, which can be analyzed both qualitatively and quantitatively. Make sure you have a plan for how you're gonna combine it with your own internal data and how you're gonna take that data and, and lead to some real actions. So I'll show you a bit about, um, about how we did this at SimilarWeb. So first, on the right sample, you know, we have performance marketing customers down the street. But in my first two months, I flew to London, I flew to Chicago, New York, San Francisco, I talked to customers in Latin America and Europe, and turns out, they are of a different profile, and their needs are very different than our friends down the street. Second, we have mobile customers and we have web customers. Their feedback is different. We have um, customers who are free, who've come to the site and never purchased. We have customers who pay a little bit per month, and all the way to enterprise pricing. Um, you know, we have customers who are leaving us. All of these people kind of have a different uh, opinion, set of needs, and kind of choosing the right sample of people to be able to come back and say, yes, I really understand what's driving these people either to pay or not to pay, uh, to stay with us, to leave us, is a really big deal. Um, if you're going to do real quantitative analysis at the end, uh, there needs to be some kind of randomization um, as well, but that's, but that's a separate story. Um, in terms of the inter interview guide itself, you know, what do you ask? There's the obvious, okay? These questions are always amazing. I'd like to understand how you use the similar web product. Do you have any feedback? Of course you're gonna get tons of stuff. But there's actually a science behind the other types of questions that you can ask. So one example of Sherry. Um, you know, this question, on a scale from one to 10, please rank the following in terms of how important they are to you. And then things like data accuracy, price, uh, user interface. There's actually a science behind this. There's a science behind how this question is written. There's a science behind how you analyze this. Um, and actually, the way that you're asking the question is of forcing your customer to choose between things. Now, I think your instant reaction is gonna be, 
Uh, of course, everyone's going to say price is the most important thing. It's not the answer. And actually, we see very, very, very different um, priorities for our different segments of customers, which really helps us understand not just how to build our product because of things people asked, but actually because of things that will make them buy. Um, another example, Sherry, just how do you ask about competitors? It's not just compare me versus you know, my nearest competitor. But if you start very broadly, tell me about how SimilarWeb fits into your suite of marketing or analytics products. You're actually gonna hear about many more things, um, many more tools that are competing for budget with you. Also, um, understand kind of what other things they're looking at when, um, when they're kind of comparing to you. So for us, we heard uh, about a tool that's very, very different from us, but many of our customers also use. And when we're building our dashboard, we started looking at their dashboard to try to understand actually, you know, this is something that they're comparing us against in, term, in terms of user interface. The other thing about this question is when you're coming to listen and not to, to you know, sell, you're going to learn different things. It's amazing, amazing how many of our customers told me how much they pay, how much uh, they pay for our competitors' products annually, things they would never, ever, ever say to one of our salespeople. So I can actually benchmark pricing for some of the enterprise pricing that's not available online in this way. Um, the amazing thing about all this is not just taking this data and uh, analyzing it, and you can make tons of graphs and actually it looks you know, it's like data an analysis, it's not just quotes. Um, but the amazing thing is what you do when you combine the results with your own internal data. So not just your other voice of the customer data, so at similar web, that's our cancellation survey, that's uh, lost opportunities in our sales process, um, why, you know, when we ask why. Um, but what, what we did in the first few months was actually look at uh, our revenue data and understand kind of how those customer interviews match our revenue data and which segments of our customers that we identify during the interview process are actually um, kind of uh, making up what percentage of our revenue. Um, with usage data, and kind of the most interesting one is actually with a behavioral or a data science kind of segmentation. So you can actually have kind of your data science team build you cohorts based on um, behavior and say there's kind of these users that go to this section of your platform three times a week. But if I go talk to 20 of those users, I can actually name them and call them SEO managers, for example. And then that's the most powerful type of segmentation. So when we did this just in the first few months of SimilarWeb, Shiri, we had an aha moment, we had a number of small ones, but we had one very big one, which was that our customers who we thought um, would primarily be online marketing um, people were actually, you know, that was a very big core segment for us, but we actually had a lot of our revenue coming from investors, strategy uh, consultants like I was, um, corporate development teams, kind of what we call a business researcher. And turns out those people have very, very different needs, ask for very different things, use the tool in a very different way than all of our online marketing uh, customers. And so now, if you can imagine you know, where we're going, Shiri, um, that has a big impact on kind of how we're thinking about our product strategy going forward, how we're thinking about our marketing and our branding going forward, um, and as well, how are we thinking about kind of our sales pitch, uh, our pricing and packaging going forward. Um, so just to summarize, you know, I guess the two major things. One, it's about listening to your customers. You can listen in a lot of different ways, but listen, don't talk. And kind of two, if you're going to have this kind of interview process, there is a methodology, it's a science, it's not just, um, you know, something fluffy where you hear an anecdote and maybe think whether you should develop your product towards that. Uh, any questions? Okay, thank you. So thank you, Nathan. So I think we, we heard um, 
it was fascinating because it was three different, very different uh, approaches. Um, the one presented by uh, Nimrod, which focused on segmentation, Tanya, which focused on KPIs, and Nitan, which focused on the qualitative aspect of actually listening and driving insights. Do you want to join for the Q&A? Tanya? Nitan? So, any questions? Come to the come to the campaign structure and optimization best practice gym that we are holding in our offices once every couple of weeks, where we have like a dedicated session of two hours about the auction, the marketplace, what this bid resembles or stands for in Facebook, what are the limitations of the different delivery optimization mechanisms. Generally, no, we love that you target very little people. When you target a group of 14,000 people, on a given day, about 8,000 are online, and for about three or 4,000, you're absolutely not eligible to show your message because it's less relevant. Remember the slide when we were talking about 1,600 stories to choose from. So it's not that we, everyone that we are targeting and bidding against will see an impression. There's this like I said, ruthless selector at the door that decides whether this information is relevant, whether it's paid or organic. And it's true that sometimes if you are actually targeting 4,000 people, you might just reach two or 300 a day. And it's very, very slow to actually like grow a business on that unless each buys like a Mercedes. So basically like the, 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 the short answer is you will need to work with the much higher bids and in case you're not getting delivery with OCPM, this means that your message or media is not really converting. The signal that the delivery system gets back is one that resembles a bad user experience. So raise the bid, improve the creative. If it doesn't work, just buy plain CPM. Say, okay, I know that I need to reach these 10,000 people. Buy impressions to make it to their eyeballs and let us know how it goes. <laughs> okay, but you like, recommend to be specific, not, not, not to um, like, target your um, uh, bigger audience. Well, if you target bigger audience, obviously it'd be easier for you, but if you lose your intent or your signal as a result of broadening this target, then your business results would be the same. You would just pay for more impressions that are being served in vain. So, yeah, no, absolutely. If you have a very, very clear segment that you know that you need to reach, reach them anyway. Reach them with CPM or with CPC or with, with any way. Just make sure that you're bringing them great, relevant, interesting content that they value and then they will love you. Awesome. All right, good luck. Thank you. Can I ask you something? Yes, of course. Um, what is, is it that you're marketing? Um, Many campaigns and working with many uh, brands. That, what I'm trying to understand is why your audience is as, as significant, as significantly small as you said in advance. I'm being myself some products here. Products are very like for a certain niche. And we are like, looking for a really like a specific audience that really uh, it, is interested in the, that niche. Can you give an example? Um, Okay, so this is very interesting because it's prestige uh, marketing, it's a marketing of prestige products. Yeah. So this is a very specific audience that may or may not make a decision in Facebook, so it was. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually copying one of his latest talks about um, not targeting those people only on Facebook and using Facebook only as, a, as an assist to install. I think, I'm not sure I never bought a yacht, but I think you should be 
very welcome for that, but I'm not sure that you browse around Facebook and waiting for someone to present your ad. Basically what I'm saying is that maybe brand awareness, like the one just said, would be a better choice for you, and brand awareness doesn't have to be specific to, specific to the people that will eventually buy. Maybe their TAs or their assistants would be better for you. This is just a new notion, not a... Okay. Because it's very hard to reach your audience when you target a very small audience. For now, I'm more familiar with Facebook, but uh, yeah. thank it's, you for your It's a very good choice, so yeah. I was asked uh, when Ethan came up about the A-B testing tool for, for Google. I will just elaborate one more thing about it. Uh, Google finally opened the, uh, I'm not working for Google, nor I ever will, but Google finally opened an, an amazing tool that's called the A-B testing tool. So if you have an app and you have an Android app and you're not A-B testing your Play Store page, like right now, not trying five different experiments, so actually you can run one at a time, but you're not running an experiment right now, you're wasting your time, really, seriously. Nothing you can do is more significant than improving the conversion of your Play Store page. Nothing. This is what I want to say about it. Okay, any more questions? So I think that means you did a very good job at uh, explaining uh, your messages. You have three very different uh, messages. So thank you, all of you. It was fascinating.